I'm John Cochran. I am a professor of criminology at the University of South Florida. I've been a professor here for about 20 years. Oh. Uh, sociology is the, um, for, within the United States, sociology is the, the parent discipline of almost all of criminology as it's practiced in this country. So uh, it, it's a direct relationship. Uh, from the sociological perspective, we look at deviant behavior, which is broader than just criminal behavior, and we examine you know, societal reactions to it, which is, would be the criminal justice system with regard to crime. So we ask who's doing it, what are they doing it, and how do we respond to it? Uh, and so a lot of my work has always been in testing the various theories of criminal behavior from a sociological perspective. But in addition to that, and maybe of greater interest, is my work in um, kind of a criminological assessment of the death penalty. So the death penalty in one hand is um, very fascinating to the lay public, to my students, because it's a sexy kind of topic. It's, uh, it's a hot social issue. At the same time, it's also a hot social issue that's likely to disappear, meet its own demise, uh, probably within the next 30 to 50 years. So, so it's, it's a dichotomy. You have this really hot, sexy topic, but it's also a dying topic. Essentially what, we, what motivates this is, is you're, you're dealing with a life and death issue, literally a life and death issue, and particularly a unique kind of life and death issue in which the state, the government, is going to take the life of one of its citizens. It is doing so intentionally, voluntarily, uh, purposefully. It's setting a time and a date and a place uh, to take the life of one of its citizens. Wow. We study a number of issues here. We look at who supports the death penalty and why. It's kind of a public opinion thing and that's an area of my, my inquiry. Uh, we look at who gets sentenced to death and who doesn't and are they sentencing them right or not, or are there biases and uh, evidence of racial, geographic, gender, social class disparities and who gets the death penalty from who is spared? That's some of my research. Um, but one of the areas that I am involved in is looking at uh, the effects of capital punishment on the family members, the families of the condemned, the families of the, of the victim and how they are, are coping with uh, their situations and, and the death penalty is that situation. Uh, the methodology is one of looking at first of all two types of families that we're going to compare and contrast. One is the family of the survivors we call them, that the, the, the families of the victims uh, whose uh, family member has been murdered and how they're coping and they're coping they in turn get broken into two types. One uh, has had their loved one's killer sentenced to death, and the other had their loved one's killer sentenced to usually life or something certainly other than death. And we can compare those two, how they're dealing. And then the other set of families are the families of the condemned, the, the families of, uh, of people who, who uh, have a loved one who has been sentenced to death uh, for killing someone. And we're comparing how they stack up. And then in turn, both family types are being compared to kind of um, non-death penalty analogs. So the family of the victims who lost their loved one to a murder are somewhat analogous to families who lose a loved one to a traumatic accident. It's a sudden, unexpected loss of a loved one and, and they have to cope. So, and maybe what is r routinely found is that uh, the family of the condemned are suffering in many of the same ways and are having difficulty coping with their bereavement in many of the same ways that the, the families of the victim are. Uh, but the family that suffers the most are the families who lost a loved one uh, whose killer in turn was sentenced to death. They have the most difficult, most interrupted, most challenging bereavement experience. Uh, so th there's a common notion that the death penalty provides closure, but this is a misnomer. They are told this, they state this over and over and over again repeatedly. It is very common for them to state this at the day of the execution. 
But the reality, the lived reality, the experiences of these people is that it takes years, nine, 12 years for the condemned to eventually be executed. And what they find then is that it is only at the, the execution event, which is a rare event. It doesn't happen that often for people who are sentenced to death. Uh, it is only once the execution takes place that the bereavement process begins in earnest for these families. So it's a delayed, interrupted bereavement process that goes on for, uh, for, for nine years, 12 years on average before they even get to start in earnest with a more normal, natural bereavement process. Um, those whose, whose killer was sentenced to life often express dissatisfaction with the sentence but are then very able quickly to get on with the bereavement process and it's a more natural sequence of bereavement and they get on to it more normally. And so these two different types of families of the victim have very different bereavement experiences only because of the death penalty. Then the death penalty makes the bereavement experience for the family of the victim who, whose, whose killer was sentenced to death interrupted, unnatural, difficult, painful, extended, and there's all kinds of, of social, psychological, economic, emotional uh, problems that these families experience. The irony? The irony is that the families of the condemned experience exactly the same kind of disrupted bereavement process uh, due to the death penalty.